Hello and welcome to another episode of Vienna Arbitration Talks. I'm really happy today to host uh, Patricia Shaughnessy of the University of Stockholm here with us. Uh, hi Patricia, welcome to Vienna. Thank you, Peter. I'm happy to be in sunny, beautiful Vienna. Thank you. Uh, Patricia is here in Vienna because she's lecturing at the Austrian Arbitration Academy tomorrow. Uh, as you know, she is a professor at the Stockholm University, but she's been teaching both in Sweden and abroad. Uh, Patricia is the, the immediate past chair of the Arbitration and Dispute Resolution section of the Stockholm Center for Commercial Law. And she was on the board of the Arbitration Institute of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, uh, or the SCC, for uh, 14 years. Uh, so, Patricia, you've been living and working in Sweden uh, for a while now. You've been, uh, uh, you have contributed to the last three um, versions of the SEC rules, uh, as well as the revisions of the Swedish Arbitration Act. But uh, as I understand, you moved to Stockholm from Hawaii. So now the inevitable question, how do the beaches in Stockholm compare to the ones in Hawaii? Well, the beaches in Stockholm are uh, refreshingly cold. <laughs> you don't go for a swim, you go for a quick jump in and... Jump out. <laughs> <laughs> Patricia, you were the mastermind of the International Commercial Law LLM at the Stockholm University. Uh, the LLM has built up quite a reputation. I know that uh, we have our own moot court here at the law firm uh, for young students and professionals, and we've always had exceptional students from the LLM. Uh, I wanted to ask you, how did the idea come, uh, come up? Who, who came up with the idea for the LLM? Well, actually, I came up with the idea, interestingly, during a year where I had a leave of absence and I was a judicial fellow at the U.S. Supreme Court. And then I was going to be returning back to Stockholm, and I got the idea to return back and start an LLM program, which I thought was a natural complement to our arbitration community, which has a long history of hosting arbitration. And we had the Arbitration Institute and a robust arbitration community to collaborate with. So um, we also had the advantage that education is free for EU students in Sweden and the foreign students pay rather reasonably low um, fee, tuition fee, it's only 9,000 euro a year. So that also makes us especially attractive. And of course, many love the Swedish winter. <laughs> and those cold, those cold beaches. Yeah, I, I guess it's a bit uh, dark in the winter for go, to go swimming, right? Perfect so. for studying. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, Patricia, let's go to our topic for today. We've agreed to uh, discuss recent developments uh, in uh, integrating ADR procedures into arbitration. Uh, let's start with uh, ARB Met ARB. Uh, can you explain to us what kind of issues can arise in these proceedings? What is actually ARB Met ARB? Well, let me back up a bit and say that we've seen in the last <laughs> decade quite a bit. I think all of your um, watchers are probably familiar with multi-tier escalation med arb clauses. Right. So that's kind of the last generations where you would have a pre-arbitral procedure which created some gateway issues. And so the new trend is to integrate these procedures into an arbitration. So hopefully you won't have the issue about when the arbitration can commence and whether or not preconditions have been met that can cause a cloud over the arbitration all the way up to challenges. So in the new um, concept, you start with the request for arbitration and then the procedure through party agreement by reference to rules or in their contract has a mediation window, which if unsuccessful, will result in resuming the arbitration and going to a adjudicated award. Um, when would this uh, mediation window happen? Is it, I guess, first there you file a request for arbitration. I guess there's also an answer to the request. Uh, when would this mediation then afterwards commence? It's a great question. Um, these are relatively new procedures and they have them in the rules. And I would suggest that you have to look at the rules to see what the rules mm -hmm. say. If the, if the parties agree to it in, in an arbitration clause and then you're dealing with that procedure according to the clause without the benefit of the structure of the rules, then I would imagine that probably at the case management conference, the first conference that the arbitrator would take up this discussion with the parties as to what they envision, and hopefully the parties have a common vision for how the mediation window is going to work. So first we have the arbitration, and then mediation begins. Uh, who would do this mediation? Is it uh, possible for the arbitral tribunal, for the chairman of the, tri of the tribunal, the chairperson, to be uh, conducting mediation and then perhaps continuing as arbitrator? Or would you appoint another mediator? How does that work in different rules? 
The lawyer answer depends. <laughs> but we can be more specific. It depends on the rules. So if you look at, for example, the Singapore rules, which they have created together with their um, Arbitration Institute and the Mediation Institute, then you would read the rules as to how this procedure is supposed to go forward. Uh, if you didn't have the benefit of some rules, then again, you'd have to consult with the parties. Generally speaking, if we look at the, the, this idea of arbitrators and mediators having interchangeable roles mm -hmm. is something which has occurred and is culturally acceptable in many Asian environments for some time. And we even see um, that in some other jurisdictions as well. And so that it creates issues if an arbitrator shall act as a mediator or vice versa. We can get into those in, in a bit. But I would say one should have parties commonly agreeing. You should have consent to these procedures to ensure that you don't create a problem. Um, what you've just mentioned right now, um, I would imagine if an arbitrator then turns into a mediator, then goes caucusing with the parties, talks to one party separately, talks to the other party separately, would that maybe um, raise grounds for a challenge later in the arbitration proceedings? Again, an excellent question, and we've seen that issue even be addressed in case law. Um, the idea of an arbitrator receiving ex parte communications from one client and being specifically told that this is confidential and that information may not be transmitted to the other party, of course, is uh, quite uh, alien to our concepts of due process and arbitration. However, if the parties specifically agree to the arbitrator taking a mediation role, which would include caucusing mm -hmm. with individual parties, then that agreement should be ideally in writing. And I would say that most courts would probably find that that would be a waiver of a potential procedural error. So what is the difference basically between this mediation window in our met our proceedings and uh, facilitating settlement? So, uh, for example, there is a perceived role of uh, an arbitrator in this regard, uh, which can be very different depending on where the arbitrator is from. And there's been a long-standing debate whether it is appropriate for arbitrators to uh, facilitate settlement. I'm talking now about pure arbitration proceedings and the role of an arbitrator facilitating settlement. I guess there is a difference between this and the window for mediation in ARB med -Arb proceedings. Yes, exactly. That's an excellent point. And again, in the ARB med ARB, the mediation window could be conducted by party agreement by the arbitrator, or it could be referred to at the external mediator, and then if it doesn't settle back. But the trend, as you noted, has been increasingly to expect the arbitrators to take a facilitated role towards settlement. And looking at the different trends and where they come from, one can see that role is being different. If we look, for example, at the ICC guides on how to handle the proceedings efficiently, it indicates the arbitrator should suggest the parties can settle the case at any time at the outset. Then we can go to the other extreme where we have the DIS recent rules, mm -hmm. and they say at all times during the arbitration, the arbitrator shall encourage settlement of the dispute or any disputed issues. We have the Prague rules, I think it's Article 9 of the Prague rules, um, indicating that the arbitrators should facilitate settlement and upon the agreement that the parties could even act as a mediator. So we're seeing in a number of contexts um, this kind of what I call the Renaissance arbitrator, <laughs> that the arbitrator should not only be an adjudicator, I think many arbitrators perceive their role as being an impartial and independent decider of issues to adjudicate. But now arbitrators may be perhaps expected to take a more active role in facilitating or encouraging, or even perhaps taking on, if the parties ask, the role of a mediator, officially or unofficially. And that creates challenges and opportunities for the parties and arbitrators. You have uh, spoken about facilitating settlement. What exactly does this mean? What can an arbitrator do to facilitate settlement and when during the proceedings? Can that's a, that's that? an excellent question. And how can you do it without uh, risking uh, losing impartiality? 
Uh, that's a <laughs> really an excellent question. And I think um, when an arbitrator, it's one thing at the beginning of the proceedings in the, in the first case management conference to say to the parties, well, of course, we encourage you to settle at any time. And if you need any windows of opportunity for that, that's, that can be done. But when you have to actively start encouraging or facilitating a settlement, what exact tools, what skills, what things should you be engaging the parties in? And that probably is going to vary quite a lot to party expectation and to arbitrators' background and experience. And it can be a bit of a challenge because many of the most experienced arbitrators may not be particularly skilled, trained, or experienced in settlement and mediation techniques. We can perhaps underestimate Mm -hmm. what those techniques are and how they are used to be effective. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and we've spoken about these different cultural approaches. Uh, we can maybe move to our final topic for today, which is diversity and arbitrator appointments. Uh, as you know, a couple of uh, episodes ago, we hosted Lucy Greenwood in our show, and we discussed gender diversity. Uh, today with Patricia, we're going to discuss cultural and uh, geographic diversity. Uh, Patricia, you're representing the SCC in the ICAS Diversity Task Force. Can you tell us what's going on at the task force? Um, uh, what, what is being discussed there? Well, the task force is mostly represented by members of uh, leading arbitration institutes, but it does have a few other members to the task force. And the idea is to try to capture uh, what is happening with diversity, particularly gender diversity, in, in, in the international arbitration community. So we're gathering statistics, gathering initiatives, gathering different types of activities which can help to enhance greater gender diversity. I should mention that, of course, diversity is much broader, mm -hmm. but there's another ICA task force on inclusiveness, which is looking at regional, racial, religious, and other types of diversity. Um, gender diversity, we know, has uh, gotten a lot of attention, which it deserves, and it needs more attention. In recent years, not the least from the pledge. Mm -hmm. So we've seen great strides in that department, and we need to put more attention on geographic, racial, religious diversity. Um, I had, uh, for example, a well-known Russian arbitrator asked me a few years ago, gets appointed a lot, why am I only appointed when there is a Russian aspect to the case? Uh, Americans and Canadians and Swiss are appointed around the globe, even when there are no connections to their legal systems. Uh, so, and I think that's a question we need to ask ourselves. So when it comes to gender diversity, we've learned that institutions seem to be doing much more and much better than parties when they are appointing arbitrators. Is there a difference, uh, a similar difference when it comes to geographic and cultural diversity in um, whether the uh, arbitrator is appointed by a party or by the institution? Um, the institutions have been the drivers of gender and other diversity. And I should also mention age. We're trying to increase and I see we, arbitration institutes generally, are trying to increase the pool of potential arbitrators to reduce having an elite group that get repeated appointments and having more arbitrators that in the arbitration world are young, under 40. And um, they can bring to the table a lot of experience and they can be particularly suited for certain kinds of cases. And so the institutions have been the drivers Hopefully, we'll see that the parties, which are very influenced by their legal counsel, will start to appoint more. Um, in Sweden, we've seen a huge difference in the last couple of years where last year, or in 2018, actually when it came to appointment of arbitrators, the parties had a statistically higher number than the institute. So I think the parties, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, but the institute was running around low 20s, and I think the parties hit about over 30% were appointed. Oh, that sounds great. I wanted to ask you, is there a connection between uh, this, um, uh, this increasing the pool of potential arbitrators uh, with what we discussed before, with um, uh, getting more facilitators of dispute resolution into arbitral tribunals? I think definitely, and I think you hit on that a bit earlier in one of your comments, noting that there's a cultural difference about the approach of the role of the arbitrator in getting involved in facilitating settlements, either informally or as a mediator. 
And that is a big cultural divide. The, the Germans have one approach, the Americans another, the Asians have one. And so if we start to expand the diversity, we'll also start to see that the role of the arbitrator and the type of procedures that they are experienced and competent to engage in mm -hmm. will change. And parties may be more inclined if they want to engage in a procedure which integrates ADR into it to appoint an arbitrator that comes from a culture, comes from an exactly. experience, comes with a skill set which enables them to be able to better do that. It may create opportunities from, for younger, uh, from different geographic areas, from different backgrounds to be appointed by parties and by institutes as arbitrators. So we will have to see how we can achieve more diversity and more inclusiveness in the appointments. Uh, one last question, do you know when the report of the diversity um, task force is coming out? It should be coming out, I think in late spring, early summer. Uh, we'll see whether or not we can incorporate the 2019 statistics from institutions. It, they may be a bit late to come out to, to bring them in, but we'd like to finish the work up and hope that it will contribute to the future. And the future of arbitration, we all hope, despite the discussions going on with, with uh, investment state arbitration, I think that the future of arbitration remains bright and it will be even brighter if we are more inclusive and not just inclusive in terms of the arbitrators, but also in their skill set. Exactly. Oh, well, I very much hope so. Um, I'm looking forward to reading the report in spring. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Patricia, for joining us today. I wish you and your participants tomorrow at the Austrian Arbitration Academy a lot of fun. And uh, hope to see you here in Vienna very soon again. Uh, and uh, thank you for watching, dear viewers. Uh, join us next time for uh, another exciting interview. But until then, greetings from Vienna. Thank you.